All right, Genesis chapter 25. Here's what the word of God says. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country. While Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents, Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he's also called Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. Watch this last part. So Esau despised his birthright. So Esau despised his birthright. I want to take a few moments tonight, and I want to look at this passage of Scripture, and I want to preach from a pastor to pastors. And I want to talk from the subject, Esau's error. Esau's error. I want to get you guys back up in a moment. I love both of you very much. These are two servant leaders in our church, bro. I love to see you guys tonight. Give these guys a big round of applause. They're just serving the night, part of the team. If this is how y'all clap for servant leaders at another church, I'm worried about y'all church. Let's, maybe, I, maybe I will do a workshop. Maybe I will get my whiteboard out and teach y'all some church culture stuff, but we'll get there. I'll be nice tonight. I, um, I don't know, man. A couple years ago, I was living over in this neighborhood uh, further from here called Morningside, and I, uh, I went over to a, to a friend's house in the neighborhood. And when I got to the house... Uh, on the outside of the house, there was um, stickers and there was like some signs around the house and it said, beware of dog. Now, I don't know about you, but like when I see a sign like that, I take heed. I'm like, okay, you know, like you got multiple signs out here saying beware of dog. What kind of, you got like a, you know, you got a wolf out there. I don't know what you got, you know? So I remember I got into the house and when I got into the house, I, um, I said to these guys, I was like, yo, so where's the dog? And they go, oh, bro, no, we ain't. We ain't got no dog. That's just a sign we put out in the yard. It, it, it made me laugh a little bit because it was a projection of security. When I first moved into my house, we live in the Grove, not too far from here. Um, the first thing I did, someone say the first. The first thing I did when I bought that house was, yo, I put so many cameras up in my house. I got an ADT alarm system. You come to my house, bro, you better be careful because that thing is secure. We got cameras everywhere. It's like a casino pit at Caesar's Palace, okay? Like, I got a whole, it's, it's scary, all right? But you say, why is that? It's because what's inside the house is valuable. It's pretty simple, right? That you secure that which you value. I only got one wife. I don't plan on having any more, all right? I can only handle one. I only got three kids. Those kids can drive me nuts, but I would gladly lay my life down for my children. They're my kids. They're my responsibility. And because of it, I secure my home because what's inside my home is priceless. What's priceless in your life? The things that are priceless, you protect at all costs. Whatever it takes, I'm going to secure it. That's right. yeah. That's right. I think it's important that you understand that as you step into the ministry, yo, there is a target on your back. That's true. That's true. Has anyone learned this yet? That like, the more ground you start taking, the more opposition you face. I wish I would have known a little sooner that like, the bigger the vision, the bigger the opposition. Just because you start stepping into new stuff doesn't mean that you don't have to deal with new attacks. When we first started our church, 
uh, it's an eight-year journey. But, I mean, bro, there's a bunch of us that were here. We were over there at JDD, a little middle school in Wynwood. We were excited. We had taken a whole year ramping up, you know. The longer the runway, the bigger the takeoff. We, we, we said it all, you know. And we took off. And when we took off, I was like, glory to God. The next day, Monday. I hate Mondays. Why did we do a pastor's assembly on Monday? <laughs> Y'all are like, I preached yesterday. I ain't got nothing more to give. On Monday, we got served our first lawsuit. Glory to God. <laughs> 13 different street artists from Miami came against us, suing us for copyright infringement because the middle school that we are renting, that we donate money to, was covered in graffiti art, and we took photos of the school saying, come to our church, which is this school, and then the artist said that we use their art to get our message across, and therefore they wanted money from us. Glory to God. <laughs> Week four, I'm on the cover of the art edition of the Miami Herald as the art thief. <laughs> you got to love God, though, because God's got funny ways to promote people. <laughs> Sometimes God will use the attack of the enemy, and he will say, I'm going to use it as a setup to actually get some news out. Don't curse all your problems. Yeah. You gotta know that as you're stepping into the ministry, there is a target on your back. You are in the game. You're gonna be getting some headwinds. You're gonna be facing some opposition. These are Jesus' words now. He said the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy you. Let me make this real clear. There is a real devil who looks at you in your life and says, I want to invade your home. I wanna jack all your stuff. I wanna annihilate you. I wanna destroy you. I wanna wipe you off the face of the earth. But I hope there's some people in this room that would say, you know what, I know there's a big attack therefore I understand I gotta get some security I gotta protect this thing and don't get me wrong a sign that says beware of dog that might work for a little while but God forbid a real intruder comes up in there they're gonna discover that was just a projection of security pastoring is not about projecting security I think it would be helpful as we just get in here tonight that if I could help you in any way, and it's a journey, I'm not speaking as an expert, I'm speaking as a co-laborer. It is not enough on the journey of being a pastor to simply project it. The call that God has given you, he called you. It's a gift that he called you. I just feel it so deep in my spirit in this world that we're living in. I don't know if we're going to share none of these talks to anyone. I don't know if I'll ever do this again. I just know in 2024 right now, there are all sorts of attacks against the church, attacks against pastors, and I just came in to tell some people, what you do is important, what you do is sacred, what you do matters. And all hell wants to steal your calling. All hell wants to break down that very thing that God whispered to you brought to you, gave to you, and you better learn to protect it. You can't just, you can't project, projecting security won't be enough. It doesn't matter how many people follow you on social media. It doesn't matter what event you get to speak at. It doesn't matter how dope your fit is. None of that stuff, none of that stuff will protect you. And I came tonight to try to encourage some people that over the next few hours that we have together, that if we could get you to a place that you're not just projecting security, but you start to possess some security. See, projecting security says beware of dog. But when you possess security, beware of God. Beware of God. This house is protected. I am protecting this call that God gave me. What he gave me is sacred. He called me to it. If he started it, he's gonna finish it. I'm gonna be faithful. I know who I am. Come on, anybody know who you are today? You're a child of God, washed in the blood, called and purposed and ordained for such a time as this. Come on, if you believe it, somebody give God some praise in this house. Give him some praise, give him some praise. 
I, I, I I want to I show you something. If you value your call, you will protect it. If you value your call, you will protect it. It, it leads me tonight to, to look at uh, a, a bit of a text, a bit of a story, and we're going to get there. But I want to look at um, two very, very famous twins, aside from the Olsen twins. This is uh, <laughs> Jacob and Esau. I love the story of, of, of Jacob and Esau, and there's so much there. Um, I, I love preaching Jacob. If you're looking for some good material, I mean, Jacob will preach, bro. My man, that, that dude, there's so much there to preach Jacob. His name means deceiver. He, he came out second, grabbing his brother's heel, loved by Rebecca, steals his brother's birthright, goes and literally like puts on animal hair to behave like his brother to his father, Isaac has to flee, goes to Laban's household. That, all of this stuff is like full-on eight-week series, by the way. You don't, like, you don't need to go look for material. It's right there, okay? You don't need to find something relevant. Just go, like, he's at Laban's house. Remember that whole, do you know the story? Of, that's a crazy story. Like, Laban's like, yo, you worked for me for seven years, bro. I'm gonna give you my daughter, Rachel. He's like, I'm in, man. Only to find out he works for seven freaking years. Some of y'all can't even keep a staff member for seven years. See how you can preach that to your staff, you know? Some of you staff members in here, seven years. And what, is, what does Laban do? Laban tricks him. He, he don't get Rachel. He gets Leah. The Bible calls her the weak-eyed one. That's New King James for ugly. Ugly. My man goes to bed, wakes up, whoa! I like people be like, yo, how could you ever go to bed with someone you weren't supposed to go to bed with? It's like, people do it every day, bro, you know? Every, it's, it's preaching, it's preaching, it's easy, it's easy. Wakes up, he's like, I can't believe it! He's like, all right, this is what we're gonna do. We're, another seven years, 14 years, 14 years. Finally gets Rachel. Then he deceives his uncle Laban. Remember that next story? He goes out and then he, he goes out there and all of a sudden God encounters him and we believe it's Jesus. It's a Christophany. It's like Jesus in the flesh and they have a wrestling match. This stuff preaches, bro. They're wrestling. Yeah. Understand that whenever God wrestles with someone, he doesn't wrestle with someone to prove his strength. He always wrestles with people so that you might admit your weakness. That's good. That's good. God's not after a match with you. He wants, he wants a moment with you. Even then, he, he wants a moment with you. And I love that story of Jacob wrestling with God because what does God do? God says, after they've wrestled on, he goes, he goes, hey, what's your name? Yep. It's a very, very important moment. Jacob says, my name is, is Jacob. This is very, very important in the life of every leader and every person. God is getting him to admit who he actually is. Yeah. Jacob means deceiver, manipulator, liar. Yeah. See, Jacob has a great calling, but he doesn't have great character. And before God can get you to become who he's called you to become, he's going to have to get you to confront who you actually are. Before you can find security in God, you're going to have to admit, I'm weak, I'm foolish, I'm a liar, I'm a deceiver. Can you work with that? Anybody grateful for a God who's still working with jacked up? Come on, where's all the screwed up? I got some problems, but I'm grateful for the grace of God. Come on. Are there any pastors who are grateful for the grace of God? He makes them admit it. He says, you got a calling, but you ain't got no character. And they wrestle, and you know that story, he touches him by the hip, and next thing you know, he's got a limp. I love all that, he's got a limp. A lot of people want to hide our limps, but our limp is always our testimony. I would say love your limp. Your limp is any area of your life. Any area of your life that if God had not redeemed it, it would have ruined you. It would have ruined you. Jacob walked with a limp. What did God do? God said, all right, I hear your name. Now I'm going to change your name. You're now going to be called Israel, the one who struggles with God. God is into changing names. It's all throughout the Bible. It's good preaching material. You can teach it to your church. I'd encourage you to do so. He takes Jacob, turns him into Israel. He he takes Abram, makes him Abraham, turns Saul to Paul, turns Simon to Peter. I was studying the other day. You know that Simon, it means reed or it means um, water. Watch this. 
Water takes the shape of anything that goes into it. But Jesus says, you're now gonna be called Peter, which means rock. See, when God comes and meets you and encounters you, he doesn't imprison you to your past. He doesn't define you by your present. He always speaks to your potential. The future you, the real you, the mature me. Peter means rock. What does a rock do? A rock changes the shape of any space that it invades. So he says to Simon, I'm gonna start calling you Peter because that's your real identity. You're not there yet, but I wanna let you know everywhere you go, Peter, you're supposed to change stuff. You're supposed to disrupt stuff. You're supposed to shift the atmosphere. God changes names and he gives him a new name. I love preaching Jacob, but that's not what we're preaching tonight. I want to, I want to preach, I'm never, I want to preach about Esau. I never preach about Esau. Right away, we open up the text and the Bible lets us know something very descriptive about him. Esau is hairy. Now, how hairy you got to be for the Bible to mention it? It's worse than that. His parents look at him, he's so hairy that they can't get any other word to come to their brain. They say, all right, Esau. Esau means hairy in Hebrew. What a shallow name. But it's a shallow name for a shallow man. Because how shallow you gotta be to give away the very thing that God gave you your birthright for a bowl of soup. You're lacking some depth. You're lacking some wherewithal. You're lacking some self-awareness. Have you noticed there's a lot of pastors in 2024, I'm like, yo, you don't know how good you got it. You get to get up. I don't care if you got five people or 500. You get to open up God's holy word. And you get to proclaim the truth of God's word. Do you know what you got? I was talking to my friend Mike earlier today. I love Mike Todd so much. I want to make sure I say that every time he's in a room publicly because this man takes way too much unnecessary criticism from Christians. I won't correct people tonight, but I'm just like, come on, yo. It's not the world that's against Mike Todd. It's another message. This is an assembly. (laughs) We were talking about just coming up in ministry and like, bro, like I don't ever want to get to a place that I can't remind you of where I came from and how it began. Talking to Lyle today, bro, the glory house. I'm making up terms for your house. It was never called that rich. <laughs> but bro, like, I just, I mean, he's like, it wasn't called that, you know? The bongo ministry is where Lyle came from. <laughs> but dude, I have like vivid memories of being in college and like, God, putting a burden on my heart and speaking to a Bible study that went from 10 people to 20 to 40 to 60. I vividly remember driving across the state of Georgia for five hours to get to a meeting that when I got to the meeting, there was only five people in the room. Your boy still used a microphone. Because it was never about the five people. It didn't matter if it was 5,000. All that matter was he called right. Come on, somebody, give God some praise. Do you know what you got? It's a shallow name for a shallow man. Harry. Sorry if your name's Harry. Harry. And old boy Harry comes out one day from working real hard, and he's out there, and he's real tired. He'd been hunting, and when he finally shows up, there's his brother Jacob, making stuff. (sighs) 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 
tired, fatigued. Do not make decisions. Don't make deals. Don't negotiate when you're tired and fatigued. When, it's crazy, yo. You get thirsty enough, you'll drink anything in the fridge. <gasps> I'll take that. Pastor Chris Hodges taught me an acronym years ago. I still love it. I don't know if, if, you're, if you're a pastor and never heard it before. Let's just share it. It's HALT. H-A-L-T. Don't make decisions when you're hungry. Don't make decisions when you're angry. Don't make decisions when you're lonely. And don't make decisions when you're tired. If you got one of those symptoms, you halt. I was thinking the other way over. Like, I've just done so many dumb stuff in ministry. And um, I remember one time, I don't know why I'm led to even share this story, but I'm going to... Um, I, I think out of all four of those things, if I'm going to really be honest, the thing that I would struggle with the most, the most is, is, is the A, anger. Anger. And anger is an interesting word because most of the time when we think about anger, we only think about it from the external side and the outburst. But many of you, you have an inward anger, which is what we call depression. And it's because I have a vision, which is beautiful, but I'm always locked in this frustration cycle that the thing that I'm expecting is never actually being revealed. And how long can I stay like this? And you got to be careful when you're living angry because you do dumb stuff. You ever sent that email? You're like, why did I send it? You ever send the text? You're like, oh, I wish I could get it back. Obviously, someone at Apple must be dealing with pastors because they're like, we're at the edit button now. <laughs> I remember I was working for my dad years and years ago. And I got to be careful because the person might be in the room. You never know. God redeems stories. But there was this dude on the staff that was just annoying, bro. He's there. He's a diva. He wasn't about the church. I always knew. I was told, dad, dad, he ain't about the church. I see this stuff for you, but you don't see what I see. You're the leader, but I'm serving you. <laughs> That's how some of your staff talk, by the way. Anyways, um. And I was like, Dad, this guy's bad. This guy's bad news. I'm scared he could literally be here. We are not streaming this. But this guy's bad news, bro. This guy's like up there. Like this is, you know, it's always the worship ministry, by the way. Is this not the pastor's assembly? I don't know. We didn't invite worship teams, did we? I don't know. Did we? We have worship teams here? Oh, God. Our worship team's in the back on a smoke break, you know? God forbid they hear the word. Um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Like how many times you got to compliment the worship set before they can just be like, good sermon, man. Good sermon, bro. This is therapy tonight a little bit. Um, but I got like, I was angry, yo. And like, I... And this is the story. This is the story. I don't know. This is not my notes. This is the story. Um, we were doing, we were doing, Don Shree wants me out. I'm getting out. I promise you. 42 seconds. We'll, we'll get out of it. And, um, and we, were, we, were, we were in this service and it was like a, a stage show where the whole worship team had to stay up on, on, on the set the whole time. And they had to be up there doing like all the things that were happening on the stage. And uh, this is like many, many years ago. And so the culture's a little bit changed around like cell phone usage. But back then this was like a no cell phone policy. And my man was on the stage the whole time, like up there just like texting. And I'm on the front row like... I won't do it, I won't do it, I won't do it. Which means, put the cell phone down. I don't know American Sign Language, but that's what that means, you know? N never saw it. Well, I, watching his bad behavior, pulled out my cell phone, and I started writing. I thought I was writing my dad. We need to fire, and I said the name. His name, I hit send, not to my dad, but to the guy. stage, folks. Someone say halt. Learn from my mistakes. Learn from my mistakes. We, we, we get angry and we do dumb stuff. We do stupid stuff. But here's what I want you to see. And I, 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 we're going to sing. I promise you. 
Here's what I want you to see. And, and, and this might be, I'm hoping we're cracking open something. The Bible doesn't say that Esau gave up his birthright because he was tired. The scripture doesn't say because he was fatigued and didn't halt, he exchanged the valuable thing that God had given him, his birthright, for a bowl of soup. No, the Bible actually says that Esau despised despised his birthright despised his birthright I have brought you here and invited you to Miami to hopefully create a safe enough space that for a moment you can let your guard down because some of us are in this room right now and we would never say this aloud but you actually despise your calling. It's not that you got tired, it's that you actually are despising the very beautiful thing that God has given you. This word despise, this is what it means. It means to regard with contempt, distaste, disgust, or disdain, scorn, loathe. I like that word contempt, because that's a big word that we should learn. It happens a lot in interpersonal relationships. That's what we're all doing. We're all building and shaping community. However you go about doing that, I think the role of the pastor is to bring a spirit of unity. If there's unity, you can do anything. So I don't care what the name over your church is. I don't care if you do long worship, short worship. I don't care if you go line by line. I don't care if you bring unity, anything's possible. But where the enemy loves to mess us up is this little word called contempt. This is what contempt means. Contempt means the feeling with which a person regards anything considered mean, vile, or here it is, worthless. Worthless. And for Esau, when it really came down to it, that birthright to him, he didn't see the value in it, and therefore, he did not protect and secure that which God had given him. And if you're not careful as a pastor, you will despise the very thing that God gave you. Now, I'm not trying to be like mean, like I'm in this thing with you and I feel it all the time. I, I, I heard a stat the other day, I guess it's a Gallup poll, that 41% of pastors right now would get out of the ministry if they had a real viable option. Yo, that means half the room? Half the room's not even really in the game. Playing not to lose, maybe. Certainly not playing to win. In the room going, man, where's the exit, man? Is there, is there, I'm looking for another business opportunity. I'm just doing this. I'm in a holding pattern. 41% of the guys and girls out there doing it, they say if they could do something else, they would take it. That's what we're dealing with? That's what we're working with? And before I become a critic of it, like, I have to understand it, and I'm like you, I'm a pastor preaching to pastors, and it's like, why do we despise it? Well, I'm a preacher. Five D's of why we despise it. D number one, because it's difficult. We let us say that, it's difficult. We had a guy one time leave our staff, he's like, I wanna get a C-suite role. I was like, a C-suite? I had to look it up, I didn't know what a C-suite was. There's CEOs, chief executive officer. There's CFOs, chief financial officer. There's COO, chief operating officer. There's CMO, chief marketing officer. I was like, oh, I do all those jobs. You can do that here, you wanna do that here? Oh, you want a title. Oh, you want a position. I've just always had to operate from purpose. But it's difficult when you're starting a church. It's difficult because nobody taught you at Bible college like you were saying, Ashton. Oh, I gotta learn how to manage money? I just wanted to preach. Oh, I gotta deal with difficult people all the freaking time? And everybody on my staff just wants clarity. If you could just 
if you could just, okay, I know, okay, I know you just got done preaching. If you could just describe the vision one more time, and really me and my role, how do I, I need clarity, Pastor. This is difficult. It's difficult. It's not just difficult, it's dramatic. Y'all can start playing because I got way too much message. Y'all start playing. These guys are servant leaders like, our pastor is crazy, you know? It's dramatic. It's dramatic. Like, it is dramatic. Your life is dramatic. High highs, low lows, big moments. There's some sort of like TikTok, this girl going around. I don't know if it's true, but I, I, her, what she says, I sure had that experience. She said that the average person goes through seven major relationship shifts in their life. The average pastor goes through seven a year. That's dramatic. When you meet people, you go, I wonder how long you won't be with me. I wonder how long before you leave me. It's draining. It's draining, yo. I've been wearing this Garmin watch. And we've been checking my calorie count. I preach at 1230 at the city. 700 calories I burned in one sermon. How do you stay fit, Pastor? Preaching the Word of God. It's it's, it's draining. It It can be depleting. I think it's daunting. It's a daunting job. Anyone like me, like, we just had the greatest year ever at Voo Church. Like, literally. Like, I don't know, most salvations. Um, we're buying buildings. Uh, the, our biggest giving year. A, 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 a tangible sense of God's presence. Favor in the city. But, yo, it's like, it's January. Let's do it again. But we just did that. You got another message, Pastor? I have you done what I told you to do last Sunday? This is daunting. This job, part of its requirement is you gotta be a faith person. You ain't gotta shout like me and you ain't gotta be loud, but you gotta have faith. Now faith is being sure, listen to this, sure of what we hope for. Certain of what we cannot see. Faith is the absence of sense. If you can see it, if you can taste it, if you can smell it, it ain't faith. That is daunting. It's disappointing. And I, dear God, I did not invite you to come to Miami to get more disappointed. Some of y'all been avoiding every type of conference. I, didn't, I don't, I don't, I, literally, I think the word conference is a trigger for people. If you look at everything VU, it's like VUCON. It's not a conference. It's a convention. This is an assembly. Because some of you, you see how my mind works, I'm sick. But I'm actually, because I understand that some words are triggering for you and you've avoided every place that God says, come and drink. I've got a well for you, but you avoid it and run from it because you come to stuff like this and you just get more disappointed. Somehow you'll see something and you're like, oh, why don't we do that? And how come he's got that? And look at that thing. And some of you've been here the whole time. You're like, the whole time you're like, how do they do the stage? That's where your brain's at. I know it. I'm there. It's like, cool, good message. Tell me where to buy these lights, man. What kind of a microphone is that? Is it always two keys? What's going on? What are they playing? (laughs) Kind of soothe me for a moment. Can we do that too? I I get it. And so coming to this stuff can disappoint you. But I don't want you to leave disappointed. I want you to leave encouraged. And the word that the Lord gave me is whatever we've got, and I'm not talking about ideas, but you can have all of our ideas, whatever is on this house, whatever is on this place, that it would be imparted and transferred into you, that you would leave this place recognizing, I got a call. 
Here's what I believe. I want you to try to get this into your spirit tonight. I firmly believe that when it comes to this idea of, of despising my calling, I wrote it this way. If we don't learn to get disciplined in our calling, it's possible that you can eventually despise your calling. I have to get disciplined. And this is a year for discipline for some of you. That you put some restrictions on your life, that you put some boundaries on your life. Here's ministry. Ministry is not a sprint. You knew it was coming at some point. Ministry is a marathon. I don't know how I'm standing up here. Yesterday I ran 26 miles yesterday, my first marathon. It is a journey, yo. And one of these days I'm going to do a whole just collection on marathons because there's just, God just speaks to you. But one of the biggest lessons that I learned about getting disciplined for the run, getting disciplined for the journey, was I heard this analogy given, and I think it's going to help you tonight. So listen to this podcast, and the man was describing the idea that you have to learn how to train appropriately. He talked about it this way. He said, you know, there's two ways to mow the grass. You could go buy a lawnmower and mow it, or you could go get a razor blade, and you could get out there, and blade by blade, you could cut it. Both would work, but one is much harder than the other. He said, what's amazing about long distance running is that a lot of people think that when they go train, they just got to go and lay it all out there on the field, run as hard as they possibly can, as fast as they can, until they feel like they're going to die. That's what I always thought. I was like, if I don't, I, I think I'm supposed to think I have asthma every time I run because my mind tells me harder is better. But if you learn anything about marathon training, it's not true. They would suggest that 80% of your runs are supposed to be what they call an easy run. Say, what's an easy run? An easy run is at your aerobic heart rate. It's going somewhere. You take 180 minus your age. For me, that makes it 141. That 80% of my running is supposed to be at a 141, 141 beats per minute. That's what my heart is supposed to be doing. I shouldn't run above that. Here's the thing. When I run at a 141, it is so slow. Like it's pathetically slow. The other day I was out there with my boy Omar. We're out there running. And dude, I'm like, I got more in me. Let's go. He's like, bro, you got to stay at your, you got to stay at 141. I'm like, oh my gosh. There was a dude, this is, this is the devil. There was a dude who passed me. Come on, y'all. People pass you. It's like, mm. all right. Omar's like, no, you got to stay back. You got to stay back. This joker came back a second time. <laughs> this man ran by me four different times out there, Lyle. I'm like, who in the, is this guy? But if this is not a picture of what discipline looks like in the body of Christ, it's not about your speed. It's about building your stamina. Some of you are living an undisciplined life and you will eventually despise the very thing that God gave you because you're seeing people run by you and rather than get at your pace, which is in your grace, you're trying to run faster, not because it's what God ta- called you to do, it's because you want to look the part. It's called projecting security. Come on, somebody, if you believe that, I give God some praise. You gotta find your pace. And for me, we could talk all night, because I love it. Maybe tomorrow we'll spend some time on it. Like habits, I think, are everything. But if I could just give you two thoughts in your brain as you think about your spiritual habits, your spiritual disciplines. Richard Foster talks about our disciplines not being the thing that creates the change, but rather just puts you on the path where the change can happen. Prayer, meditation, fasting. You think I feel like fasting? No. I fast because I want to tell my body, body, you're not in charge of me. Body, you don't get to define my destiny. Body, you don't determine where it is that I'm going in this life. I'm called and purposed, and therefore I'm going to steward my body. But something that's helped me so much on the journey, and I'm on the journey, yo. 16 years in full-time ministry. I'm on the journey, yo. 
is when I think about my habits, it's two words that always come to my mind. It's the wonder and it's the work. You need to form habits around the wonder and the work, the wonder. If you're here tonight, man, and you've lost your wonder, it's a dangerous place to be. If every time you open up this book and all you feel is responsibility, you're in a dangerous spot. If no one's told you recently, this book is a whole lot easier to preach than it is to live. Not that hard to preach some of this stuff. Hard to live it out. And some of us, you're not weary in your spirit. You're weary with God. You've lost the wonder. You've lost your awe. Whoa, he called me and he chose me. I'm Jacob. I'm a deceiver. I'm an idiot. And he called me and he wrestled me. He stayed up all night in that wrestling match, not to show me that he was stronger, but to say, I will patiently wait upon you until you finally give in and I will change your name. I have called you and purposed you for such a time as this. It's the wonder. It's the wonder. But it's not just the wonder. It's the work. There is work in this thing, bro. Jesus, he told us the harvest is plentiful. It's plentiful in Leeds. I already know it's plentiful in Nashville. Definitely plentiful in Miramar. I don't care what city you go to. He already said the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. People go, Rich, why do you get up before church and work out? Because it's all about me maintaining my sanity. I'm not out there trying to look cool on social media. I'm trying to inspire some other pastors to say, yo, this thing takes real work and you better get some disciplines in your life. Otherwise, the very thing that God gave you, you will eventually despise. I talk to a therapist every week. Why? Because I learned years ago, if I don't get my own therapist, I will turn every one of my staff members into my therapist. And I burn some relationships looking for them to validate something and to process something with me that they're in no position to have to carry. Some of you think you're delegating. You are dumping on people. But you have to get a discipline around your work. I got to take my wife out. I got to spend time alone with her. I got to find something. I'm a a creative, yo. Like, I got to find something that inspires me. Something that refreshes me. This is what Jesus said. This is John chapter 6. Jesus answered, the work of God is this. To believe in the one he sent. I know our job is difficult and draining and dramatic and daunting and disappointing. But so is being a trial lawyer. Trial lawyers just try to get people out of jail. Homie, you're trying to get people out of the gates of hell. And it's going to take some work. And you say, what is the work? The work is to believe. Believe. Believe that if he called you, he is faithful to complete the work that he began. Believe, believe, believe. And I felt it in my spirit on the way over. It's not in my notes, but in my spirit, I just sensed it so much. You say, what's my work? Your work is to believe in the God who started this thing, to believe in Jesus. He's begun something in your life. And some of you right now, you're about to eject, or you're about to quit, or you're about to run from your calling, or trade it in for a bowl of soup, because you don't realize that life is in seasons. They come and they go. And some of you feel like you've been waiting for so long and God has not said no. He's just said not yet. For me, believing in Jesus is this word, wait. Someone say wait. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. We are in a really interesting time personally and I just think it would be fake to come up here and not share it with you as we're spending some days together. But we got a few months back, uh, we got a diagnosis about my father. My dad's my hero. I love him. Pastor the same church for 25 years in North Miami. Uh, my dad, but also just my hero. And um, we discovered that he has a rare form of cancer. It's a bone marrow cancer called myelofibrosis. And, and with it, 
he uh, just t- two weeks ago had to check into the University of Miami Hospital where he's going through a stem cell transplant. What's difficult about the news is the doctors had told us that if he lived with the fibrosis, it would give him a few years most likely. But then the really difficult part of it all was that there is an opportunity for a cure with this stem cell transplant. However, the stem cell transplant is a dangerous thing to do to a man who's 72 years of age, that if he ends up going in for this thing, it might not be the cancer that kills him, but it might be the transplant itself. And so it's been an interesting time and God's stretching our faith and we're encouraged tonight. But in all of this, my dad who's been pastoring the same church up the street, He's like, yo, we got this big building and I'm definitely on my back for the next nine months. And it was always my heart that you, you, you would have it one day, but we're not in a position just to give it to you. There's a note. And so we came up with this deal that we're, we're, we're buying my dad's building. It's all happened. It's done. It's great. Glory to God. But I, man, I had this thought the other day because some of us are in the room and like, I see you and this is, I, I, I love it because like real recognizes real. Some of you though, you're like a, like a stallion, like getting ready for a race. You're like, ooh, like, I see it. Like, I love it. But it's that horse behind the gate that's so pumped up that doesn't have patience that they get injured before the race even begins. And sometimes the work in ministry is to recognize that this is a marathon and I have to learn how to wait on the Lord and be patient. Because I'm 39, I'm gonna be 40 this next year, but yo, I've always been this way. When I came out of Bible college working for my dad, I had good ideas, I did. Counselor, help me see it. <laughs> I was always like, oh, we, gotta, we should do this, and we should do that, and we should do this, and we should do that, and we should do this. Yeah, we should do this, we should do that, we should do this. They were good ideas. In fact, I, I firmly believe that they were the right ideas. But Dad, <laughs> although he knew I had a great calling, like only a father can, can also recognize, but you don't have the character for it. And we got to a point we were there on staff, probably the seven year mark, Don Cherie, where we thought we were gonna take on the church and it was like our dream for a moment. Like, wow, we're gonna be the lead pastors here. And it was this exchange going back and forth and then quickly it was just taken off the table. And I just remember I was there for the next 18 months and I was just at a lid, like I just was, I'd show up to the building and I was like, just, there's no wonder. I didn't love the work. I was always escaping. By the way, I was escaping to ministry. Some of you use God to escape. You use ministry to escape. You, 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 you speak in Christianese, but really you're just avoiding the real stuff. And so I was running from it, I was running from it. And finally dad, his good father, he's like, yo, you gotta go start a church. Like, bro, you, you, you gotta go. And I was like, I don't know. And, I was, and, he, and he pushed me out and it was God's providence. Because it sent us down to Wynwood where God started giving us skills. We had to learn how to load into a middle school. We had to learn how how do you do six services? How do you do six services in a row? How do you, wait, you gotta load into another high school down the street. You gotta have to get a semi. We had no semis at dad's church. Then all of a sudden a lady calls us and says, hey, I want you to buy this building and design. Okay, how do you know about us? Because uh, I hear about what you guys are doing in Wynwood. Oh, wow. What'd you hear about Wynwood? Well, we know you you had a lawsuit, but um, (laughs) turns out maybe you're not the art thief. (laughs) And maybe you got some character. And then we, we buy a building, and then all of a sudden, the pastor that was here, he said, hey, we, I got a building in South Miami. And what I want you to see is the dream of leading that church was actually a yes. But God was just saying, Rich, not yet. N- not yet. Had I taken the church way back then, I can't even, this is pastors, bro. I would be in a denomination I don't want to be in. I would have a governance that I do not want. I would have a mortgage that I could not pay. I would have no influence outside of North Miami to even begin to stretch into this area. What I'm trying to get you to see is that God sees it. He sees the end from the beginning. And he says, wait, your work is to wait. Waiting is working. Waiting is working. Wait, waiting is working. Habakkuk says, if it seems slow in coming, wait for it. Albert Einstein said, I'm not the smartest. I just stay with problems longer. 
And some of you, this is a season right now that you got some big problems back at home, but I want to encourage you, lean in, linger, stay, wait, because help is on the way. 16 years later, we bought the building. We had money, we, put, we already put a million two into it, cash. I'm not saying this for me, I'm just saying it's God's providence. He was saying, of course you're gonna get that. But trust me right now, I gotta teach you how to be a man of character. There's some skills that if I give it to you right now, you won't know how to work for me. I'm gonna close and I'm gonna pray for you. And you're like, Rich, you've closed four times, I know. But I want you to see this. Because how many of you know, you don't know what you have until it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. Mm-hmm. Hebrews 12, 16. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, Harry, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit his blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. And I have not come in here to badger you or to put you down. I've come in here to help you tonight, to open up your eyes. Don't be casual with your calling. Being casual with callings leads to casualties of callings. I've taught our staff for a long time. Yo, don't take yourself too serious. But what you do, you better take that serious. I don't take myself that serious. But this call that God gave me, because if you don't steward it, and if you don't get disciplined around it, you might eventually despise it. And if you get to the place that you despise it, and it's taken from you, well, look at what Esau did. Genesis 27, verse 34. When Esau heard his father's words, He burst out with a loud and bitter cry. And he said to his father, bless me. Me too, my father. Bless me. Me too, my father. I want to let you know that God has called you and God has given you something. You can't earn a birthright. We're not sons and daughters by worth we're sons and daughters by birth that's the whole gospel we've been born again new identity it's your birthright it's your calling God gave it to you but the error of Esau was not that he got tired the error of Esau was that he did not value that which he had We can talk tricks and we can talk tips, but I am telling you that you are the beginning and start of your church. You are the creative director. You are the worship pastor, Mike Todd. (laughs) It's who you are. You teach what you know. You reproduce who you are. You're going to get tired. You're going to get weary. But just because you get tired and just because you get weary doesn't mean that you have to fall into error and despise the very thing that God gave you as a gift. That's what Isaiah said. He said, even youth grow tired and get weary. Woo! But those who wait on the Lord. Ha ha. But those who wait on the Lord. I called some men and women to Miami that would say, I'm going to wait on the Lord. Those who wait on the Lord, he shall renew their strength. I sense you getting stronger. I sense you growing. I sense you advancing. He shall renew your strength. Give God a shout of praise over this house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you just bow your heads with me? The Lord made it very, very clear to me tonight that this was a night for people to come and for them to find security in Christ and Christ alone. For them to protect that which is priceless, your call. 
I believe in you. I see you. I love you. I think what you're doing is really important. Maybe you're not getting celebrated by anyone. Maybe no one's ever telling you that. I see you. God sees you. Run your race. Run your race. We need you. God's inviting you into this journey. And our team wrote this beautiful song. And since August, it's just been my anthem. And I think tonight it could become your anthem. And it's a really simple phrase. You can use me, Lord. Yes. I wonder tonight if you could give God permission again to use you. Yes, yes, yes. Would you invite him in and say, God, I, I want to be used by you. I, I think tonight's a night of re-signing up. Some of you, need, maybe you're in a wrestle tonight with God. He'll wrestle with you. Maybe you've been waiting for so long and God said, no, no, no. I didn't say no, I said not yet. Your work is to wait. When you wait, God says, I work. My friend Ryan's here tonight. He's just gonna lead us in worship. We're gonna take the next 15 or 20 minutes. Maybe you wanna get into a different position or a posture, but man, you have been pouring out but now you're here in a place tonight that could you begin to value again? Could you find the joy again? The joy of your salvation, the joy of being used by God, the joy of being called by God. What a privilege. God, what a privilege it is to be used by you. Come on, you didn't get into this thing for notoriety. You didn't get into this thing for fame and success. I'm not against any of that stuff, but you got into this because you said, I love you, Jesus, and I wanna be used by you. That's right. I don't want to walk in error tonight. I get tired, you get tired. I say dumb stuff, you say dumb stuff. We make bad decisions. But the error of Esau was not that he got tired, it's that he despised the very gift that God had given him. You don't need to self-sabotage any longer. Tonight you can step into the light and you can receive his grace and mercy. You can use me, Lord. If that's your prayer, then I want you to lift your hands. If that's your prayer tonight, maybe find yourself on your face for a moment. Let's begin to cry out to God and let's begin to invite him into this place that he might use us.